So I wanted to talk uh, uh, today, tonight, I'm not sure where everybody is. Um, I entitled my talk, Wisdom in the Wounds. And it's really a lot of the work that I do is how to use mindfulness and compassion pra practices for self-care and for community care. And I work in a lot of communities that are under-resourced, um, kind of traumatized areas. And I realized that um, for some reason, uh, meditation, mindfulness, compassion, uh, wasn't so much finding its way into a lot of communities that I felt could benefit from it. And so a lot of the work I do, other than teaching at the college, is uh, teaching youth and kids and seniors and whoever I can get to, to just talk about these concepts of mindfulness and compassion and how it can um, really change our relationship with ourselves and our own well-being. And it gives us some tools we can share with our children. And also it can help um, mitigate the impact of suffering that some whole communities are experiencing. So it's uh, my life work. So we did the opening meditation. Uh, this was the rain practice. And there are many versions of the rain meditation that you can get on YouTube. And as I've said, I'll also make another recording. I like to start off my presentations just with this notion of do no harm, especially when I'm working in different communities. And um, it's important that we think of this in relationship to ourselves as well. We just have that consciousness and heart and temperament of doing no harm to ourselves or to others. And, and while you're listening, also, I like to introduce this, that you're listening from different vantage points. We're not just one construct, I guess I would say. We have different aspects to ourselves. And so as you're listening, listen as an individual, like what this means to you personally, but also maybe what this means to you in your profession whatever that might be, or in your role, or however you show up. And then if you do have an affiliation with an organization, then what might these things mean? And how might they play out in your organization? For example, do you have a compassionate organization? Do you have compassionate leaders? So as I present, I want you to listen from uh, different vantage points. Um, when I was here in last year, I talked about the what I call the multifaceted powers of mindfulness and compassion practices. If you go back to May of 2022, you can see the last uh, offering at that time. And that was more about self-care. And I created these uh, tools that I called powers that you could use to take care of yourself. And then people said, okay, that's good to take care of myself, but what about all the other people in the world that might be suffering? Well, I also do presentations on that. So I came back in July and I talked about uh, compassion in society, compassion in the world, and how can we embody the changes 
that we would like to see in the world. And today I'm back with a little bit of a combination of both of those. Um, I've learned personally in my own life, the wisdom is in the wounds. What do I mean by that? If I'm able, um, either on my own or perhaps through therapy or a friend or a religion, um, to confront issues that I might be going through or perhaps that I've gone through in the past, I can use mindful tools and compassion practices um, to provide more wisdom for me and to um, help me heal and uh, to kind of transcend my prior wounds. And this has been really powerful for me in the work that I do in communities. One thing I want you to think about, this is a great tool. I use it a lot in different workshops, even if I'm working with one person or many, and it's called tracking. And some of you, I'm presuming might be familiar with it. It's just where you're mindful and present and conscious about how you're doing, right? So you're, you're tracking for yourself. How am I mentally, am I engaged? If I were to apply it to this um, presentation right now, Am I mentally in sync? Am I understanding? How am I physically? Am, do I feel any stress or strain? How am I emotionally? I know when we just did uh, the last exercise, some of you wrote in the chat, it kind of tapped in to some emotional things for you. And you found that when we had to look at our issue from a different perspective, that wasn't so easy to do, right? Because we had some kind of emotional tie to it. And then finally track ourselves kind of spiritually. And I'll let that be because that could mean anything um, to you. Not doesn't have to be specific to how I define it. It's specific to how you might define it. One thing I realized that's really good when you have people from different locations and different countries and people that speak different languages and different ethnic groups is that we don't really have to be anything other than who we are, meaning there's efficacy and power and just being just who you are from your culture, right? And your perspective in your life can help connect and inform other people. In my classes at the college where I teach, I have students from around the world and they help me teach my courses, right? Because they, they have the French perspective and I have students from Italy and Brazil and Japan and Korea. And I don't know everything. I know uh, frameworks. I know history. I know something. I have my own wisdom, of course, to share. But I have found each year that I teach and now um, in my 11th year, that I get a lot of insight from my students from around uh, the world. So I just want to share something with you that's kind of uh, from my perspective and from my culture, uh, just in hopes that you get a sense of uh, why I do what I do. Okay, that relates to compassion and mindfulness. So let's see how adept I am at making this work. Okay, I have to optimize, share sound. Okay, okay, okay. And uh, hmm, there we go. Okay, 
Let's see, let's see. Okay, can you all see that? A group of 12 year old kids? That seems quite clear, yes. Great, okay, let's hope you can hear it as well. I'm from. I think, let's do it directly. I'm from Haiti and Nigeria. Um, like three things, like I'm Dominican, uh, Puerto Rican and Black. I'm biracial. I have an African-American father and an Irish-American mom. My name is Lamine. Um, I'm Muslim. I'm Indian, British, Scottish, and American. My parents are from Venezuela. And I was sharing like one of the foods that we eat. And then I got made fun of. They were like, what is that? Ew. Oh, ew, what is that? And like, like I cried because <laughs> I felt like, oh, there's something wrong where I'm from. Like maybe like it's bad, like I'm different. I am an African-American adopted girl, only child. Um, and I live with my two dads. I remember when I was younger, I went to with my family to a restaurant and they made us pay in advance just in case we like didn't pay afterwards. And that was kind of upsetting. You start to notice that people are different and you have comments. Might, they might be racist or they might not be. But by the time you get older, you know that it is racist and you should stop. I feel a little scared about if I, you know, just walk down the street, you know, cops might just think I'm, I'm doing something bad. And then if I try to explain to them, they won't listen and then just start beating me up and doing terrible things to me. I think there's like this anxiety that kind of comes with being biracial, like that kind of eats away at you. Like almost like you have to prove yourself like that you're one or the other. Like, for example, like I hear the phrase, you're not black all the time. People sometimes think that I'm supposed to like talk ghetto or like whatever that is oh she's uneducated because she's african-american because i'm hispanic or latino i can't have like a lot of money just this weekend i went with my friend to urban outfitters and we're shopping and i really try on this dress and then there's like why and this white privilege is the idea that in your everyday life, life you're getting treated differently and sometimes with more res respect or people just trust you more or they have certain expectations of you. Like you might be smarter or you might be wealthier um, because you're white. It makes me feel guilty sometimes, even though it's not my fault. Like I feel guilty for having a privilege that like I don't deserve. If I was ever like, the mayor is something that controls the policeman. I would want to go out and look in the neighborhoods where there are people that's very friendly so you can pick them instead of like these guys that's just doing all this training. It's better to pick people that's more minded with the community than to just pick some new guy and get on the street. Like it's just not going to work out. We have like these kids from the Ecuadorian and they get made fun of because they look Mexican. And they get told on a daily basis, oh, you like tacos? Oh, you like churros? You sell How come I saw your mom on the corner selling ice cubes? Like, it's, like, I feel bad for them personally, because I'm like, wow, like, they're not, and like, even though they tell them I'm not Mexican, I'm Ecuadorian, they still get teased. The point there, and you'll get the link, and so if you want to watch it again, so without any glitches, uh, please do. But a key point there for me in having this opportunity to speak to you is the wisdom is in the wounds. And they're just 12 years old, right? 12 years old, already um, feeling, not feeling so much compassion, right? Not feeling so much compassion applied to them and already feeling excluded. But there is wisdom in wounds. 
because when people feel safe enough and free enough to speak their truth, then we can start uh, coming together. Um, after all, compassion is witnessing or being aware of someone's suffering. And not just recognizing it mentally, which is a part of it. My, we have to be mindful. We have to notice on some cognitive level. But you also have to feel it. Right? Compassion is a heart, mind, spirit situation when it's real. And so I'm, that's what I'm about. I'm about trying to make it real, right? So that I was that 12-year-old kid with a similar story of, of being wounded by people's perceptions, by a whole bunch of stuff. And we have the ability to feel into those wounds and care. And then I think as soon as we tap into the ability to care, we may not know exactly what to do, right? But I believe the wisdom in the wound will kind of guide you and direct you, right? It might make you turn this way or read this book or have this conversation with another person that you've never had before. And I see a couple of comments. Maybe before I could, you know, jump on to my agenda, I'm wondering if anybody has just a comment to make on how you received that because it should have been on multiple levels, kind of on a mental level, you're kind of listening, the cognition of it, on the heart level, kind of feeling it, on a mindful level, on a compassionate level, on a human level. I mean, there were a lot of different ways that could have hit you. Anyone willing? I see people sharing in the chat, so that's good. I love that comment about them being so articulate. Weren't they articulate? 12 years old. And yes, it's heartbreaking. Very sad. Right. And I identify with it. I'm that 12 year old kid. As a matter of fact, I think, let's see if I can do this quick enough. I see a picture of myself. I don't know if I can. That's me. I'm that kid. And I remember feeling like that. And I keep it kind of nearby because me as the adult can help other little Lakibas, <laughs> right? Right. That's my um, drive, I guess I would say. And so when I have the opportunity to chat, and connect with others. I'm so delighted. Lisa. There you go. There. Um, were you able to conceptualize that at the time and say it? I definitely, no. 
<laughs> I mean, as a child, I, I felt like they felt, but I don't believe, well, to some degree I was able to articulate it because now they write journals, then they wrote diaries, and I wrote poetry. So in a way, I was able to articulate it in my diaries, in my journals, in my poems. I have a great poem that I wrote called Before, kind of be how I felt that age of innocence when you think you can be whoever you want to be until somebody calls you a name, somebody treats, you know, treats you bad. So I was not as articulate, I don't believe, as all of those 12 year olds, but I felt what they felt. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, it's interesting you said about that photo because look at me, <laughs> not to just, make it about me. But look at that little face. She believes she's got light in her eyes and in her, you know, and, and I still have that, but I, you know, I got wounded along the way. And so it's made me, uh, very empathic and sensitive to anyone who is experiencing any pain. When I teach my workshops, I tell my students, of course, because compassion is witnessing suffering and wanting to mitigate the suffering. And so I tell my students, well, if I called it the suffering workshop, nobody would have signed up in the space. But in fact, it is about suffering, right? And, and my talk is that there are wounds, but there's wisdom in the wounds. And if the kids are able to speak or the wounded are able to speak and we're willing to listen, then that's the beginning. That's not the end. That's the beginning you know, to, I think, moving us along as humankind toward being more compassionate to people and the planet. Or that's my thought, anyway. I mean, if I could solve it, you know, it's not that easy to solve, obviously. So I want to share something else. Thank you. Thank you for everybody uh, who's putting in their notes, I know. Yeah, yeah. I'm just reading through the chat. We could spend a little time there. Hopefully I'll get the chat. Will I, after this session? Yeah, you you can get that. Uh, okay, thank I'll, you. I'll, I'll pass that on, make sure you get that. Yeah. Okay, so... I want to share a couple of things. I know that this is a hard topic to move so quickly through, but um, we are on a time thing. Okay. So we're talking about there's wisdom in the wounds and in one of my other presentations, I talked about that things aren't that easy to change because they're rooted, right? They're, they've been going on for some, for centuries, at least generations. Um, and so some things aren't that easy to solve. Um, but the wisdom is in the wound. If you kind of get in there and look at it, you can break it down. So some of the work that I'm doing that I recognize is that when we heal individual and collective wounds, then we'll see the transformation 
that we want to see. Then we can transform families, communities, culture, and systems. Well, I can put it on a slide, but that doesn't mean just like that it's going to happen. Before, I didn't even have this many things on the last time I was here, but I just want to acknowledge what we've got working against us a little bit. There's a lot going on in the world today, you know, when there's different things going on in different locations in different countries. And I don't have everything on here, but these are the things that I know about that I can see in my limited range of what I can see that's going on in the world. That's a lot. And if you're empathic at all, you're picking up on the stress and trauma and suffering of people other than yourself. You're going through whatever you might be going through. And then your neighbors are going through something. And then in your city and in your state and in your nation and in the world, there's a lot going on. And I got this quote, Min Jin Lee, our bodies are not designed to absorb and process this much violence, loss, and grief, yet here we are trying to process it. But you're meeting weekly on mindfulness and compassion and meditating together. And I want to believe that that's going to contribute to some healing that's going to occur and spread out. I don't have it exactly totally figured out, but I know that a heart can be changed and a mind can be changed and that can open up a healing for those who are suffering. There's triggers, which we got a little triggered when we had to do that exercise because you had to think of something that bothered you. Sometimes our triggers are unconscious. Sometimes they tap into old wounds, like seeing those kids tapped me into my childhood, right? And things that hurt me then that I can still get emotional about today. Why? Because now I have grandkids two girls, two boys, and I don't want them to hurt and suffer and struggle, right? So it's, it, even though it's a past thought, it's, it's also present. So it's a lot, right? And so part of what I talk about is what can we do to help mitigate the impact of all of this stuff that's going on to myself, How, let, you know, let me get straight first, put the mask on myself first, the airplane metaphor, right? Make sure I get my oxygen and then I can help others. So the powers that I went through last year were all related to what can I do uh, self-care wise to take care of myself. And if you can go back to that other session where I kind of go into detail in terms of what each of these mean, but the opening grounding meditation that we did kind of tapped in to part of it. There's power in just closing your eyes. There's power in just being quiet. There's power in taking a good deep breath. There's power in stepping away, taking a moment when you need it. There's power in awe, things that inspire awe, right? In your imagination, et cetera. I'm not gonna give that whole presentation again. 
here's something that I showed last time that's relevant to this conversation. The challenge is the arrow, meaning how do we as a society, as a global people, as common humanity, move not individual by individual, although that's important, and not necessarily group by group, but that's another powerful thing. But how can we as a people, as a global consciousness, move from ignorance to knowledge, from racism to anti-racism, from apathy to empathy, from indifference to compassion, from judgment to understanding, from a shutdown heart to an open heart, from hate to love, from it's all about me to just like me, from misunderstanding and confusion and missing the point to seeking to understand, from aggravation and intensifying fear to mitigating fears, from being inattentive and thoughtless to being more mindful, being aware of our thoughts, from holding and maintaining power, I'm not going to let it go, I'm the one who's powerful, it's all about me, to sharing and caring. Well, that's the challenge, that we're all a part of the solution. And we're all on this arrow, right? We're, we're somewhere on here. And we need to, as a people, as a group, as individuals, try to figure out where we are and start moving in the direction of healing and caring. The thing that I found in all of my years is that in order to get people to change, there has, they have to believe that there's a mutual benefit and they have to be motivated to change because power is very seductive and it's hard to give it up, you know, um, if you don't see some benefit. I used to do uh, organizational development work, leadership development in corporate America, high tech for 23 years before I got into this work. And it's not easy getting people to change. Change management's not that easy because people need, people are stuck in how they've been doing it and they need to see a benefit to changing. And so I think this is contributing to this slow boat of change. But I'm hopeful because I feel that compassion and the, the growing of compassion and the fact that uh, you all are meeting from week to week, you're meeting from week to week, your hearts have to be opening. I'm just believing that. You, you can't be meditating every week and having these conversations and Rick, right? Without your hearts and minds expanding and opening. Now you may not know exactly what to do. And, then, and, then, and that's okay. The first step is getting your heart right. You know, getting your mind with the desire and kind of start asking yourself, what can I do? to start moving in the direction of good for the planet. Good for all the little Lakibas of the world. I like when it blanks out because that kind of represents all the kids we don't see. You know, what can we do? And not only that, I mean, I'm a senior and I see seniors on here. 
we want to leave this place better, right? We want to leave a world better than the world that we came into and that we lived through. And I think we can um, if we all keep moving in the direction that we're moving in. And it seems like a, the majority of you keep showing up here. And I'm not trying to get emotional, but I realize I'm getting emotional. It means so much to me that you're convening, that you're meeting. And maybe you're motivated because individually you have some challenges. That's okay. Start where you are. That's where I started. The more you see a benefit in mindful practices and compassion and empathy and kindness and wanting to create a better world, then you're doing everything. And I just want to encourage you and just thank you. I thank you because I think together we're kind of creating, it's a compassion revolution, power to the people. I don't know. That was the time I came out of, <laughs> but it's a different kind of revolution, right? Compassion, caring, heartfelt. And that's my sermon and I'm sticking to it. Let me look at the chat. <laughs> <laughs> Let me, yeah, somebody said the wounded, uh, the wounded healer, that is true. Some people had to drop off. Okay, okay, just reading through. Okay, anybody have any questions? I think we have two minutes, we have four big minutes. Anyone want to share something before you go into your groups? I hope some good, if you stay for the group things, I hope some good conversations come up. You're able to connect with one another. How do we get more people to think like, it's a great question. I don't know. I'm trying to it out find people wherever they are you know and so you know I had to go get a I went to the eye doctor and I was in the elevator and, and you know I'm getting in I don't know the people just opening my heart to the people in the elevator and we started laughing and then we were all around the same age and we all had just been to the eye doctor and some had drops and I had on my, sh the shade things, you know, the things they put on you. And we connected, we connected in that elevator and we were laughing and talking about how old we were and hobbled on out and went to our cars. It could be something that simple, Elaine, I see you, Elaine. Let's see, asking you to unmute. Uh, am I unmuted? Yes, I can hear okay. you. Okay, yeah, I have a question about the RAIN um, procedure because um, one of the parts is to feel what you're feeling. Yeah. And it's complicated. You know, yes, if I take is. a particular incident and it's like, well, judgment and anger is sort of mixed up. And then, you know, if I sit with it and go deeper, maybe there's some fear in there, mm -hmm. you know, and it, it just keeps getting, it changes. It really mm -hmm. changes. Mm -hmm. So I, I thought, wow, that's complicated. And then if you get if you get to the the last part of nurturing and feeling what you're feeling but what if there's like a conflict because if you change your view 
and you start looking at, well, what's going on with the other person, right? And you like go, oh, that's happening to that other person. Maybe that person's reaction to me didn't even have anything to do to me, you know, about me. And here I am and I'm angry and I'm feeling this and I'm feeling that and I'm feeling that and like, oh, but this, this person is like, going through this thing and now I'm feeling guilty of feeling what I'm feeling it's so, so a so little I mean, bit it get kind what, of complicated well it is let me just say that it is and also you're you're kind of going in that loop um of kind of believing your own thoughts and a little bit of conjecturing so in the investigating part you're detached. I know that's mm. kind of hard, right? Meaning the, they're using the word investigate intentionally because mm -hmm. investigating rather than feeling everything, mm -hmm. you're investigating, mm -hmm. you're looking at it with some distance, if that makes mm. sense and if you're mm. able to look at it from some distance you don't get caught in that loop that you just described of what they're thinking mm. and what did they say and even go there mm. what, what okay. do, i mean it's a it's a incredibly powerful practice and so i would suggest that you go to youtube and find um, the more learned people who know about the technique than myself. But I do agree with you that it's complex and it's not as easy as it seems, but what it is, it's a process to a little bit it involves your mind, but it gets you out of the loop you can get in, in your mm -hmm. mind. It's a process mm -hmm. that's trying to um, create some space between mm -hmm. the issue that you're looking at and how you're feeling and getting you to a little bit look at it as if it's not even you, if that makes sense, uh, which yeah. helps you to um, see it in a more objective way. And you have to keep practicing it. It's not a way. Oh, it's called a practice. Yeah, it's not a, <laughs> it's called a practice. A, there you go. As anything, right? Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thanks. Okay. I'm I think I'm at the end of my time. But I I thank you for anyone else want to say anything before I have to go. I think you go into your breakouts now. Yeah. Sorry to cut this off kind of short like this, but, um, oh, I did want to show you, I'll put this in the slide set. Let's see if I can do it quickly, quickly. Quickly, quickly. Uh, yes, I can. Yes, I can. Yes, I can. Um, I'll put this in the slide. I have a class coming up living with an open heart, teaching it through the Compassion Institute, starts August 3rd, it's from one to three. Hopefully you could be there at that time. If you can't, we're taping all the sessions and you can scan that. I'll, I'll send this through the slides. You can reach me on LinkedIn. I work with these other organizations as well. And then who knew? Rick has an upcoming workshop kind of related to what I was just talking about. It's called Use the Power of Love to Heal from Trauma and Past Wounds. Look at that. Is that a coincidence? That's connected to my topic. Gave me goosebumps. His is Trauma and the Healing Power of Love. It's going to be a live workshop with Rick on August 12th and 13th. So I just wanted to get that in real quick. Akiba, thank you so much on behalf of Rick and all of us who regularly attend the Sangha. I so appreciate your guest teaching. Thank you very much. Thank you.
thank you so much, everybody. I hope to see you again. Invite me back. I'll try to think of a different angle to say the same thing. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. Thank bye -bye. you. Bye, everybody.